Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by BetterHelp.com and LittleShaman.org. That's me, Little Shaman. Today, I wanted to talk to you about whether or not narcissists ever get into relationships with other narcissists. This is something that many people wonder about, so I thought we could talk about it on the show today. The short answer to this question is yes, of course, narcissists get into relationships with other narcissists. In families, there can be multiple narcissists. In certain jobs, there may be multiple narcissistic personalities as well. Narcissists are no more able to avoid encountering narcissists than anybody else is able to avoid it. So yes, of course, they do in fact create relationships with each other. We usually find that the most narcissistic person will be the leader of the group or the family, or they will be the dominant one in the relationship. By dominant here, we mean the personality in control of the relationship and the situation, not necessarily the most aggressive personality or the one who appears to be in charge. Many narcissists in this position are actually extremely covert, affecting a hero or a victim persona rather than one that is blatantly domineering or overtly aggressive. This is one reason that behavior by itself is not a concrete indication of how narcissistic somebody is. A person who bullies other people and gets into fistfights may be narcissistic, certainly. But this doesn't mean they're more narcissistic than someone who uses contrived victimhood or making what seems like goodwill gestures to get their way instead of using their fists. The dominant personality is the one calling the shots in the situation regardless of how they're doing it. The other narcissist or narcissist in the equation will usually be less narcissistic than this dominant personality. Narcissism is a spectrum and there are many people who have narcissistic traits, even really strong ones, that may not be pathologically narcissistic. There are also those that are pathological but not as pathological as the dominant narcissist. These people are particularly vulnerable to a dominant narcissistic personality because the dominant narcissist gimmick, whatever that is, will appeal to their narcissism and the needs that this creates. Narcissists can be surprisingly gullible. They are easily impressed and they can be easily influenced in this way. They are often manipulated very easily. It's not uncommon then for them to fall under the spell of a more dominant narcissistic or psychopathic personality. Their unstable identities and flexible relationship with truth, ethics, morals make them prime targets for someone with a more calculated malicious personality. The dominant narcissist may promise safety, unconditional love, retribution, fame, fortune, belonging to something, being taken care of, someone for the partner to take care of, an easy life, or anything else that they're using as a hook. In the case of cults or gang-type relationships that involve groups of people, the dominant narcissist gimmick may be the tough but fair parental figure some people are looking for in their lives, the savior that everyone loves, or the ruthless antisocial leader that others will envy and aspire to be like. The relationship is always one of mutual transaction, where the dominant narcissist reaps the majority of the benefits, but the other or others receive whatever they're looking for due to the association. For example, in a group of narcissists, the lesser narcissists usually receive accolades or special treatment through their association with the dominant narcissist. If that person is the matriarch or the patriarch of a family, maybe they receive mom's favor and good graces or a grandfather's money. If this person is the boss at a job, they may receive pay raises or time off from work. Maybe they simply receive the perception of status due to their association with the dominant narcissist. In a romantic relationship, it can be harder to see what each person is receiving because you're on the outside of the relationship, but it's always a relationship of mutual transaction rather than love or respect where both people are getting something out of this. Though relationships between two narcissists are mutually transactional, they don't seem to be very satisfying. In many situations, neither partner feels their needs are being met by the other, and both often feel the other is selfish, withholding, or just otherwise not doing their part. This may or may not cause problems within the relationship, but will almost always result in the use of other people to supplement, or in some cases, exploit. For example, relationships between pairs of serial killers, whether they are romantic couples or friends who have teamed up because of similar interests. They always involve 
involve a dominant personality who may or may not abuse the other party involved, but both narcissists participate in and enjoy the exploitation of other people. Relationships between narcissists can be extremely volatile and explosive, filled with power struggles and abuse, but they can also be extraordinarily flat and cold, with neither partner paying much attention to the other one at all. Interestingly, even though there is no real love, intimacy, or respect involved, there is a large degree of enmeshment that can happen in these relationships, and because of that, the lesser narcissist or narcissists will often defend or excuse the dominant narcissist's behavior. They may behave as if the dominant narcissist's pain is their pain, or that the dominant narcissist's problems are their problems. We see this in families all the time. If you have a problem with the dominant narcissistic personality, you're going to have a problem with them. They may present a united front against all perceived attackers or gang up against their enemies, including their own children, in situations where there are two narcissistic parents. This is likely due to resource guarding and management. Whatever they are receiving from the dominant narcissist and the relationship cannot be threatened. They've also likely figured out that if you are not for the dominant narcissist, you are against them. And they want to spare themselves the punishment that will be doled out against those the dominant narcissist believes were not on their side. This is not loyalty. It's self-preservation. If there is a situation where the dominant narcissist has been neutralized, exposed, where they've lost their status or special ability, or there is a greater threat that presents itself, the lesser narcissist show no more loyalty to the dominant narcissist than they show to anybody else. For example, in situations where a crime has been committed and the lesser narcissist is threatened with jail time unless they expose the dominant narcissist's role in those crimes. They are in the relationship for selfish gain, and if the relationship becomes threatening or the gain disappears, they often abandon it completely. This is different than some of the relationships we see with what we call flying monkeys, the people who attack or smear others on a narcissist's behalf. Flying monkeys can certainly be narcissists themselves, and many times they are, but they can also be people who are being manipulated by a dominant narcissistic personality that's being supported by lesser narcissists, and because of that, they don't realize the narcissist is not who they're claiming to be. These people are simply being conned, and they just don't know it. Many times, they only figure it out because the narcissist eventually turns on them too, or on someone close to them where they can see it. Of course, by then, it's too late. Then there is the curious phenomenon that happens in which a person who is actually not narcissistic at the beginning of the relationship takes on strong narcissistic traits and behaviors picked up from the narcissistic person. Toxic narcissism really is, quote, contagious in this way. Part of the reason for this phenomenon is self-defense due to the abuse, manipulation, and punishment received from the narcissist. Narcissists inflict the same injuries on other people as were inflicted on them, and if it goes on long enough, the other people will begin to react the same way. Part of the reason for this phenomenon is because, due to the narcissist's endless campaigning and salesmanship, the person has become convinced that the narcissist's way of doing or thinking or acting is better, and part of the reason for this phenomenon is because this is the type of behavior that the environment supports. When everyone around someone is yelling, they will eventually start yelling. When everyone around someone is violent, they will eventually become violent. It may not happen quickly, but it almost always happens. We really do become like the people we're around all the time, which is why it's very important to curate and choose carefully the people you allow to influence you. A saint hanging around with a gang of murderers for 10 years is going to have a difficult time holding on to his morality that entire time, regardless of how strong his convictions are. That's just how it is. So be careful who you allow in your space and be careful about rationalizing your own behavior. Justifying something in our minds does not justify it in reality. A pity more narcissists don't understand that. Luckily, people in this particular situation are not actual narcissists and they can choose to change their situation, end their relationship, take accountability for their actions, choose better behavior, and most importantly, they can actually notice the problem in the first place. I hope this clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online, over the phone, via text, via messenger, via email, and through Skype. So if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can visit littleshaman.org and click the book and appointment tab to go ahead and do that. 
I teach seminars, clinics, and workshops throughout the year. So if you're interested in seeing what we're running this month, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that as well. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by betterhelp.com and littleshaman.org. That's me, Little Shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you and have a wonderful day.